This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. I'm your host, Scott Colnut, and with me today are William Gatsby Pete and Paul Perry, co founders of Literal Humans. And we are going to be discussing the pros and cons of a fully remote team. Something that I'm sure is top of mind for a lot of you listening. Maybe you're considering going to a fully remote model. Maybe you already have a partially remote model. Or maybe you don't have a remote model at all and you're pretty fixed on your view of having an office nine to five working environment. Regardless of your view, it's a hot topic. And so I'm really glad to have William and Paul on the podcast to talk about their experience in going through this. And in particular, I remember seeing something like you, there was no other option for you. You knew you wanted to launch a fully remote agency. I'm really interested in that view and why you're so passionate about that view. Before we go into all of the details about today's episode, please, can you both introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your respective roles at Literal Humans and maybe starting with William? Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having us on. Um, yeah, I'm William Gazvi Pete. I'm one of the two co founders of Literal Humans. Um, and my role in the company is I'm the chief strategy officer. Um, so just focus on everything to do uh, all of our content and digital marketing strategy, both for our clients and for ourselves as an agency. Wonderful. And yourself, Paul? Yep. And uh, Paul Perry, co founder and CEO of Literal Humans. Um, yeah, focus more on the content and sort of operations and sales side of things. So, Everything from you know recruiting and, and managing writers and designers to you know bringing in new clients, um, heavy on the, the marketing and sales side, um, and just sort of trying to be you know one of the faces of the agency and, and sales calls and, um, and conversations with potential clients, um, and then operationally just trying to make sure all of our systems are up and running and you know keeping things at the agency running smoothly. So um, and yeah, Will and I have have good complementary skill sets, and we've been able to pair that together to launch the new agency. And am I right in saying that you launched the agency at the beginning of the pandemic in early 20, where are we now, 2020? Yeah, that's correct. And so I've got to know, the first question is, it would seem crazy to a lot of people to launch a new agency in the beginning of a pandemic. It just seems an unusual time. I'm just really curious to know how the idea for Literal Humans came to fruition and why you decided to launch the agency when you did? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of starts even before the agency began. You know, Will, Will and I met through the, the power of content marketing itself, where um, I was working in a previous agency, and Will sort of came into our funnel. He, you know, tried to download one of our eBooks at the, at the other agency. Um, I happened to be in London that summer and uh, just reached out to him and said, "Hey, you know, let's get a pint." You know, expecting him to be a potential client. Obviously, that that didn't work out for for that particular instance, but um, we became mates, and uh, and yeah, um, from from there, just stayed in touch and i think we just sort of had a mutual admiration for each other's like career and just each other's individuals and and kept in touch and then when you know the pandemic hit we lost a bunch of clients at this previous agency i was working at and it was sort of an impetus for me to say hey you know i kind of i kind of want to launch my own thing do my own thing I, I think a lot of people in the beginning of the pandemic were like what am i doing with my life you know the, the specter of like <laughs> death and disease like re- people were really having a uh, you know a think about um their purpose and so I, I knew i wanted to combine content marketing and what i'd learned about that industry with you know this this idea of tech for good and and companies working on a specific purpose that's helping the environment and helping the world so reached out to will and i said hey i know this is nuts but like do you want to start a new agency and I think it ended up being a really great thing because it gave us a big, juicy project to focus on during the pandemic. And then, yeah, okay, get to Will to talk about more of the nitty gritty there. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Will. Yeah, so I echo everything Paul said. You know, um, we mutual admiration, and you know, just a, the, a large part of the reason I said yes was just because you know, yeah, the chance to work with Paul and and start something, um, you know, exciting. I do think on um, from my side, on the more kind of um, calculated side of things, I did think. You know, as marketers, we all have access to, you know, those kind of um, week by week breakdowns of demographic shifts, of trends. Um, And it for me, as it became clear how long the pandemic was going to last, um, my thought was, okay, this is short term. This is going to suck to start an agency. But long term, this is going to accelerate a decade's worth of movement towards digital. And so every, you know, as we've seen in the past two years, 
every company now has to find a way to make money through the internet and through home delivery or through subscription of some a subscription. So eight companies that previously had gotten away without digitalizing had to, and it probably moved, you know, a trend that was already there, but accelerated it by about 10 years. Um, so the demand, you know, over about six months kind of doubled, while, whereas the supply of good talent stayed the same. Um, so there, from from the kind of like, along with just it being a great project that I wanted to be involved with, I, do, I actually thought there probably has never been a better time to start an agency because the, there's going to be this massive wave of demand. And, and you know, we, we've certainly seen that. And I think the two years of growth we've seen probably would have taken us more like four or five if it hadn't been for how much demand there was for folk with our skills. And had you both had the ambition to run your own agency prior to the pandemic so was it something that was on your mind but then was accelerated by what was happening in the world i would say on my end you know i i'd sort of been the number two at the previous agency i was working at and you know much respect and admiration for the, the founder of that agency his name is tyler and i sort of reached a, a bit of a ceiling where, where do you go when you're not the founder <laughs> you know of an agency yeah. so you know, just had some really frank conversations with him and said, listen, you know, I kind of want to take things in this direction. I don't know if this is the best fit for, you know, within this agency. I think it's time for me to blaze, you know, blaze some new trails and, and start my own thing. Um, if you asked me that like five or six years ago, this was not on my radar. I used to work in education and nonprofits and the charity sector. And, and that has actually ended up being a bonus for us because it's allowed us to connect with clients in that sector. And, and they like the fact that, you know, they see someone who's, you know, an agency founder who has kind of a foot in both worlds or has least experience in, in their world. So we have been able to onboard some charity and nonprofit clients. But those two and a half years of that previous agency really gave me a sense of, okay, here's here are the building blocks, here's what you need to do. And to Will's earlier point, I think it's enabled us to move faster and see around some corners that maybe we wouldn't have been able to see around um, because of some of that agency experience I had. What's really fascinating to me is that going back to Will's point, is that it sounds like, Will, you're in an odd place maybe. And I say odd because I think most people were feeling quite pessimistic at the beginning of the pandemic and you were optimistic about the next decade, which it was very hard to think or forward think, for me at least, earlier in the pandemic and early in 2020. I keep stuttering when I think about the, the time range because I f- keep forgetting <laughs> what year we're in, uh, earlier in 2020. And so one thing that I'm really interested in is, although it sounds like you were both optimistic, there is a certain element of risk attached to starting and launching a new company, particularly in a pandemic. Did you both kind of agree, hey, we're going to give this six, we're going to give this 12 months and actually see how the pandemic impacts the marketing agency? Yeah, how did that work? I think what you know what one of the um, things that certainly helped with uh, you know the model that we were looking to implement was there wasn't actually that much risk to us. Like um, you know we we had um, this big ecosystem of freelancers. We knew that as soon as we landed a client, we could pull together a team that could absolutely execute excellent content and digital marketing. Up until that point, the only thing we were really spending was our own time. Obviously, we put a, a fair bit of. Um, you know, money into building a website, getting the sort of tools and systems that you'd need to run an agency and execute um, a content or digital marketing contract. But, you know, they they were all um, fully, you know, it wasn't crazy money. And so there wasn't the the largest amount of risk. I, I think, you know, I think for both of us, it's probably a little different. Um, I was probably thinking like six to 12 months, you know, if we haven't proven product market fit by then, we'd either have to need to have to sit down and, you know, decide is there something to tweak in our business model or, or, or did we just, you know, back the wrong horse, so to speak. And, and actually, there's gonna, there's not going to be a huge demand. Um, but yeah, for, fortunately, we didn't have to have that conversation because um, everything has, has gone really well. Just to chime in too, I have to give Will some credit here. I mean, I think he, and this is, you know, I think you you try to hire people who are smarter than you and and have colleagues who are just, you know, again, complementary skill sets. And Will was very savvy. You know, he, he was very much like, very much an advisor and a sidekick and a partner. And I, I was just really trying to hustle and bring in the first few, you know, big clients. And finally, we got to a point where I was like, "Well, like, I can't do this without you anymore. I need you to jump on full time." And luckily, by that time, he was ready to leave his his full time job at that time. But you know, I think you see that in a lot of founder stories where at different phases of the business and things like that, you know, one founder or one one other co founder is able to put in different or more and things like that. And I think we've been able to kind of play off each other in a really nice way um, with that. So. Um, and I think it was just, it's just really cool to like see each other evolve in that way as co-founders and, and as the business grows as well. 
yeah, I should, I should probably shout out. Paul was all in from day one, uh, whereas I was like trying to do a full time job and then also kind of launch the agency simultaneously. So I was far more of a sort of a what am I looking the word I'm looking for? Uh, cowardly, no. <laughs> tentative, tentative, yeah, tentative, yeah, maybe. tentatively dipping my toe into the uh, agency world. Whereas Paul from day one was like, 100%, this is going to work. And uh, yeah, I, I think, as Paul said, bouncing off each other and his enthusiasm and his belief like really, really helped us in that, that first six month period. I assume you'd have you have to be quite strategic about the types of clients that you're looking for. Um, what well, you have to be strategic for any agency, you have to, ha- um, You know, we talk about ideal clients and identifying your ideal clients are a match for what you're trying to achieve as a business. But particularly in the pandemic, I know we had the discussion about it at Site Visibility about, you know, thinking about the future and thinking about who's going to be impacted by the pandemic over the next couple of years. There was lots of hesitation about working, for example, with travel companies naturally because of what was happening. Did you have to kind of make those decisions? I guess I'm really interested in how you won and how you identified those first few clients early on in 2020. I think as this goes with a lot of agencies, you end up taking on some initial clients that maybe over the long term you, you wouldn't have chosen. Um, yeah. And so we, we definitely had that. Um, and I think it was really a, a study in like disciplining ourselves and getting ourselves to understand like the best, you know, absolute best client profile, helping clients understand how they can be great clients and great partners with us. I think that's always, that's always a challenge. You know, sometimes you feel like a, a bit of a supplicant because they're paying you, but that's, that's actually not always the case. I think like the best clients are looking for you to kind of, you know, whip them in the shape, um, for lack of a better phrase there. So um, I think we, we came up with a few ideas, though. I mean, from the previous agency I worked at, we had a sense that our sweet spot was, you know, maybe late seed stage to series A, just in terms of, um, you know, where the company was in, in their growth phase. And we have actually been able to onboard some clients that are further along, like Series B, C, things like that. Um, We knew we wanted to work with purpose-driven, mission-driven companies, um, including charities and nonprofits. So we sort of kept that as an option for ourselves. And also just like we want to work with nice people. So, you know, we have those initial calls with them. And we had some doozies of calls with people who were just not really kind or not really nice. And we just decided early on that we don't want to work with folks who, you know, raise our blood pressure unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are a few of the principles we started with. As Paul said, we kind of start with that we mission driven, doing good in the world, and, and as well, you know, just stuff we think is genuinely cool um, and genuinely makes the world a better place. And that kind of initial desire for, of, from us personally has also actually ended up translating into very good business in terms of we work with a lot of nonprofits who are far less affected by, you know, short term dips and um, raises in the economy than you would think. Um, you know, they tend to have a fair amount of um, resources and most of their money comes from donations or wills and stuff. Um, the other stuff, we work with a lot of people in the B2B SaaS space, um, a lot of people in um, that kind of tech for good space mm-hmm. and all of whom, you know, tend to be having an incredible period because like you say, you know, 10 years of, of digital acceleration, um, you know, some of our biggest clients offer sort of HR tools for globally distributed teams. Um, another is a, a, a virtual events platform. Um, so, you know, th- those kind of businesses that we've sort of naturally gravitated towards in terms of interest have also actually been the ones doing the best um you know from the new normal that is kind of a post-pandemic world that's really interesting i haven't discussed tech for good on the podcast too much and so you've seen i guess those tech for good businesses accelerate and have you seen more demand for tech for good type programs during the pandemic yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think that's another just sort of you know sometimes like it's better to be lucky than than good sometimes or talented. I think we just hit the market you know at the right time when you know all these companies through the pandemic were trying to um, trying to and and also being I should say like you know helpers and good and we're here for you. You know that was just sort of the the vibe they were trying to portray. So I think you know a, a, a six months in the pandemic when we sort of hit the scene and said, hey, we we specialize in growth for companies that are taking that tax. I think that just really resonated with with a lot of companies, and then getting involved with these various networks you see in in, in the U.S. and Europe. Example being like you know Bethnal Green Ventures and and their whole tech for good investment philosophy. We connected to these pipelines of existing tech for good you know startups and just said, hey, we're we're, we're specialists in this. You know, we have a background in in tech for good and sort of nonprofit charity space, and we're also really good at marketing across you know a couple of different verticals. And I think that just you know, hit the right notes for a lot of the companies that we are able to work with. Going back to Will's point, we were talking about risk and 
Will, you were kind of making the point that actually there was very little risk because of your model, which we're going to now. It was mostly your energy, your time. So I'm really interested just starting in why did you decide to launch with a fully remote team? So was it already on your mind prior to the pandemic to launch with a fully remote um, and as you've described it, fully distributed team? Or did you make that decision when the pandemic hit? To some regard, we were, you know, our hand was forced by the pandemic and lockdown. Um, but, you know, if, if we were launching today or five years earlier, I, I, I think we would have launched with the same model. You know, I, I just think it's where smart companies are going. Um, you and And more and more where the most talented and you know the, the most talented folk in whatever vertical um whatever discipline expect um you know i i don't i if you're um a world class copywriter a world class designer paid social um you know any of the thing any of the um skill sets that make up an agent uh, our agency um you just expect that flexibility of employment and if you know we come to you with um hey we expect you to be at this specific office um four days a week i I just think it takes away a huge amount of the talent pool available to us so i I think that was a large part of it but the i mean the other is um as well um and paul can speak to this you know we had paul's expertise um from that previous agency that had done a similar model and just knew it would work the previous agency i worked at was a fully remote distributed model so um, and I, I think was somewhat, maybe I'd say, on the cutting edge of that among agencies. Um, so, so that was kind of interesting being on the ground floor of, of that. Um, I, I don't come from the agency world, which I think in, in some cases is an advantage to us because it's allowed us to just like dream and be a lot more flexible and imaginative about like what an agency can be. But also having like a bit of you know some agency background, I think, has been helpful because you do need structures, you do need processes, you need you know um, policies in place to, to some extent. So um, trying to be flexible about that. And then, yeah, I mean, you know, my previous job was sort of being director of operations at this agency. So working with, you know, a few dozen freelancers around the globe, really bring them together on a twice yearly basis with an annual retreat. We got the team together in places like Vancouver, Mexico City, Nashville, you know, uh, Denver, just lots of different, you know, interesting locations to kind of bond the team, which I think is something that we're looking to, to roll out at Literal Humans in, in the future, but also just kind of getting the systems in place uh, to to get everyone working on the same page and, and you know, doing what they can to make clients happy. So um, I think that experience for me was incredibly formative in terms of, okay, this is you know the focus and how we're going to build this agency. And, and But also here's some new things we're going to do and some mistakes we're going to try to avoid. You know, I, I think one thing we've done a little bit differently is we've prioritized a much more diverse, much more globally distributed team than than I've experienced. Whereas, like a lot of the folks, um, you know, in previous agency were mostly sort of like Midwestern U.S. based. Um, but I think having a more diverse team, having a globally distributed team, adds to creativity and access and just yeah, frankly, accessibility for a lot of that that talent. What I'm fascinated by is how quickly it went from being kind of a need to an expectation. So I feel like now we're in a place where, as Will, you described, the top talent are out there are looking for flexible working as an expectation now. And it's just changed so quickly. And I just I think that's interesting to reflect on, because at least in my working career so far, I don't think I've seen a societal or professional shift like that, where a need has become an expectation so quickly. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think it was definitely... As you say, I think society was starting to move there. I think a lot of the more forward-thinking companies that really, really focus on retention were already moving there, and a lot of other folk were starting to see, like, oh wow, you know, maybe there's something to the fact that, um, you know, I mean, I, I hate to use them as an example, but Facebook are doing that. Their retention rate is like, you know, in the high 90s. Maybe there's something there like our, our workforce has made up a lot of um you know lifelong professional freelancers um consultants um and kind of the, you know a lot of people term the digital nomad community um so yeah for, for for them it's just a you know it's it's an absolute expectation to be working asynchronously and to be fully remote but at the same time when we've um when we've hired full-time team members um again there is that expectation and it makes our uh, 
proposal much more appealing to them of, you know, hey, you're going to be fully distributed. You're going to be fully remote. We've built systems in places to look after you. We're going to try and minimize as many of the cons as possible and focus entirely on the pros. But yeah, we, we found the recruitment. It's a huge, huge benefit to landing both freelance and full-time talent. You've both mentioned the word systems now. So it feels like a good time to move on to that. So again, you've made this decision that you're going to launch fully remote. You've, you've just discussed there some of the reasons about why that's beneficial. And Paul, you then said that you had some previous experience of systems in place from another agency. So when you collaboratively worked on this and you made the decision to go fully remote, what were some of the systems that you knew you needed in place? Anything that you can reel off, whether it comes to frameworks, resources, or software, what was top of mind for you? Yeah. Um, and, and I say this from a position of like <laughs> deep humility because I'm at will can attest, like I'm just not the guy when it comes to like sometimes details, operations, deadlines. Like I'm, I'm very much like <laughs> big picture vision kind of, you know, um, enthusiasm stuff. But um, I think working as a director of operations at a previous distributed agency was really, really helpful in terms of you know, helping me and, and hopefully the agency um, work that growth edge and kind of realize like what needed to be done to keep, you know, again, keep everyone happy, keep clients happy. So specifically in terms of systems, like, I, you know, I'm trying to be more and more of a stickler around things like, you know, Asana and just making sure that, you know, Will can attest I'm like constantly on his and the rest of the team's case about just like making sure that the projects in Asana are really clear both to the team and to clients so that, you know, they can see, you know, where we are at any point in the project that just reduces things like needing to send emails and Slack messages and just consistent updates about where the project is. Cause it's, it's just right there. And if it's done correctly, you know, it should be really clear. Um, we're trying to get much bigger in, into notion, you know, like I found myself responding to all these different messages about how do you invoice the agency and wh where do we send it and what's gotta be on it. So I just made, you know, a clean notion page that has all the details on there. And I just send that link to people, for example. So trying to get in the practice of getting team members to just build those foundational resources as we go. Um, so we're not, you know, having to burn cycles, just, you know, answering the same question over and over again. And then obviously stuff like Slack for communication, uh, Google Drive for document storage and, and creation and things like that. QuickBooks we use, you know, for, for invoicing and, and payment processing, things like that. Um, what other systems am I forgetting there, Will? Uh, Wise for payment mm -hmm. in, in your local currency and, and immediately on the, what, when, what's the date we say, first uh, Monday of the month. Mm -hmm. um, I think as well, one of the, along with kind of the bit, most of the systems in place are just to ensure communication and um, everyone can work asynchronously singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, so yeah, like, Paul said, uh, the Asana and Slack are huge. We, we also use Mural um, for um, brainstorming sessions to ensure yeah. that there's still that element of creativity and excitement in the work. Um, you know, we really want to avoid a situation where, you know, the copywriter is just phoning it in to get the copy, doesn't really care about the wider strategy. The designer is just trying to, that kind of mercenary approach to freelance work that's, you know, I, I can fully put my hand up and say I've occasionally been guilty of in my previous life as a freelancer and a consultant um, and rather keep that kind of creativity that spark that enjoyment um one of the other things on a more kind of structuring level is having that core team of sort of five to ten people that kind of do all the client facing bits and make sure everything runs on time the, the, and kind of wrangles those hundred odd freelancers that we use for various projects is a, is another super important um, part of the work. You kind of do have to have that core team that are, are more full time and more on top of everything uh, as well as that distributed ecosystem of freelancers. It's so interesting that you mentioned Mural and um, also Notion as you were both talking there because we moved at Site Visibility to a fully remote model during the pandemic as well. And most of these things we were using anyway. So we had a partially remote system in place before that and we've just moved fully remote now. Um, so we had things like Microsoft Teams in place, Google Drive, the project management tools like Asana. But there suddenly became this kind of creative gap and some mm. people feeling like the creativity... I guess there wasn't the same level of creative environment as maybe there was if you're in an office environment. And maybe we'll come on to this as we talk about pros and cons a little bit more in a minute. But that's where 
going back to your original point earlier, Will, is that some companies like Mural have probably just grown exponentially because of the pandemic and because of that need um, in mm. the tech space. And Notion is another one. You know, I didn't hear too many people talking about Notion prior mm. to 2020. And now every time I, it seems I speak to either a peer or someone on the podcast, people are using Notion for all kinds of things now. Um, so they're two companies that really stand out to me that have grown in this software space over the last couple of years. I'd add um, Figma to that batch as well. Um, oh, I think yeah. they've, seen, they've seen incredible growth. And actually, I have some friends who are like in the middle of applying to jobs with them right now. But our, you know, our design team, to your point about creativity, our design team approached Will and I and said, hey, can we actually make a shift um, you know, over to Figma for a lot of our design work? Because that's just like sort of where things are heading you know, in that community. And Will and myself not being designers, we're like, sure. Yeah, we defer to you know, our creative directors and our design team on that. So we ended up getting a Figma subscription and i think that actually you know helped enhance the creativity at least on our on our design side because you know a we were deferring to their expertise and then b they were calling out a tool that is actually helping them be more effective in their jobs and Mm -hmm. and just like pointing the agency in a direction of you know more more growth and more expertise on on the design side so i found that to be like a really interesting like hey if we just keep our ear to the ground listen to this slice of our team and actually frankly just get out of their way and do what they ask we can engender that creativity that you're talking about that sometimes yeah it does get lost in the processes so i I do think as well it is a trend that's going to continue like i as society you know as you said society has shifted towards this expectation i think technology is is catching up um and uh, again i think all it's done is is take a company like Notion that probably would have slowly grown over five to 10 years and make them explode in a year. Um, and I think we'll see a lot more of that, you know, that there are already, um, you know, rivals to Notion that um, are offering different things like Coda. Um, you know, th- suddenly you go from kind of being a, the only person in your market to suddenly there being five or six folk and, and they all through capitalism, the way that they make get more of the market share is by offering a better service. So what you start, what we're using right now, you know, in five years will probably seem like basic stuff. So I, I do think the technology is getting better with each month, let alone year to foster that creativity. And I do also think if you use it properly, you can sometimes create situations where, you know, you, you get better brainstorming better work done like you know a, every, chucking a bunch of creatives into a room together you know it, it's very much a recipe for success and it's very simple you don't have to put much thought into it but you know there are people that are less comfortable in that they're more introverted and they don't speak up as much and they might have great ideas but they don't get vocalized whereas if you take that away and put them in you know a, a some form of um, video conferencing software or mural where you can chuck your thoughts down um, sort of without any pressure from other people sometimes you get far more contributions from more reserved team members um so there are pros as well as cons to the, the that kind of creativity and not being all in a room together i think being in a room together is very a simple way of getting good work but it does put a heavy emphasis on extroverted loud team members ideas and, and thoughts that is such a great point a uh, shout out to all of the creative introverts out there that point is definitely <laughs> for you yeah it, well I, I consider myself one of them i think yeah, it's weird. I talk about myself as being introverted and I record podcasts and stuff every week, but, <laughs> uh, but I am, I would consider myself an introvert. And for me, some of my most creative moments and yeah, I guess where I get a lot of satisfaction from is the, those moments where I'm alone and working through things alone. So I know myself that I felt, I think of the phrase I maybe used in conversation with people is I feel more creatively comfortable is probably mm-hmm. the word. And like you said, I think that's lasting. That's, that's not going to change now. In fact, the, I guess the way in which we approach creativity will change for the good long term because the fully remote system makes it more inclusive because you haven't just got the loudest person in the room who is seen as creative maybe totally and on the flip side i'm really interested in the oversight so there's some some good stuff that you plan for there and i'm interested in the things that you didn't plan for so in hindsight looking back over the last couple of years where maybe have you spent time where you didn't anticipate spending time what kind of challenges have you faced that you didn't expect to come up I think the biggest one for me is communication and the real, like there's no room for error. If something isn't communicated and you end up with a silo, the problem will fester for three weeks and then you will get an angry client going, why hasn't this been dealt with? There's none of that kind of safety net of a, of a office where people chat while they're making coffee and go, Oh, what? 
you know, we were meant to do that on that project or that account. Oh, but you know, I'll, I'll fix that. You know, your employees, you really have to make sure they're chatting, you know, the, the systems we've built like Asana and Slack are great only if people are actually using them. So you really have to make sure that everyone CC'd on every email, everyone, everything that is happens with the client is dropped into Asana or Slack, really, really focus on over communicating to the point of like people maybe being a little nauseous of it but you just have to make sure that everyone knows what's going on because if you don't and it doesn't get picked up it couldn't look worse when a client asks you know where's this deliverable that's three weeks late and you it's only flagged to you then by the client sending you that email um so i think that was the the biggest one and and we made those mistakes early on and we fixed them and now i think everything runs smoothly but that over communication and not being able to expect your employees just to be chatting to each other and catching stuff by themselves. Yeah, I, I'd very much agree with that. I mean, I think, yeah, over communication is, is huge in a remote um, working context. I would say on, on mine, it's just been, I think that the focus on building systems, you know, and, and really shifting your thinking from like, I come to this as a, as a writer, as a, you know, um, and, and shifting your thinking from being an individual contributor who has to do this thing for this client to, a, a you know builder of systems for other people and really having that orientation of okay I need to you know build this guide and notion for my team or I need to you know sit down with everyone and make sure that we're all on the same page about how we're going to take this engagement forward for the next month um, rather than oh I need to like actually step in and do you know this discrete task and things like that I think that's um, and and also just like I think the overwhelm well as well of you know, am I going to spend three hours today on like sales and drawing up new work? Or am I going to focus on putting out these fires with the client? Or am I going to ask someone else and delegate to deal with the client work so that I can focus on sales and marketing, so on and so forth like that? That to me, I think is just the, the hardest part of like prioritizing. And, and so much of strategy is learning what to say no to. And obviously, by extension, learning what to say yes to and what to prioritize. But I think that can be tr- truly the hardest thing is being a systems thinker and builder and, and just sort of uh, prioritization as strategy. It leads into something that I'm quite interested in. So it's about planning specifically for marketing. And you were talking there about strategy and we talked about creativity before. So just in the planning for anyone out there that's maybe in the marketing space, whether that's in-house or agency side, and they're planning to go fully remote. We talked a little bit about the software and the considerations that you need to make around creativity. And you talked about the importance of communication and I think uh, Asana, so the actual tools that you have to have in place. But is there anything else that comes to mind that's exclusive for marketers that you think people need to plan for? And one that comes to mind just because you touched on it uh, when it comes to communication and strategy is actually just the the verbal or physical communication of that because so many people are remote working through screens. I've actually had the conversation this week where some people are saying they're finding it difficult to present or present or get buy into strategic decisions because the communication isn't in a room and it's over a laptop now. So is there anything that's come up like that that are other, maybe exclusive more to marketers or creative industries? I think... Um with regards to that kind of buy into strategy, I mean, the, the main thing is to just involve the team as much as possible in the formulation of that strategy. So, you know, we, we whenever we kick off a um, client engagement for, say, a content marketing retainer of like four to five blogs a month, um, we tend to do an onboarding month where we kind of put together a strategy for them um, and, and do a sort of trial piece um, to make sure everyone is kind of comfortable with the systems. Um, but part of that will be a three-hour branding and messaging workshop with the um, client, um, which we encourage our team to get involved with. And if they can't, we record. I also then write that up. And that kind of gives us the material we need to then kind of brainstorm. You know, part of the strategy is is somewhat formulaic in terms of like, you know, it, it's what the keyword research is telling you if, if you're doing an SEO play. Um but you can involve them, um, you know, in in that onboarding month, in the strategic decisions, the you know why you're going after which keywords, um, and why you're um, going after specific pieces for thought leadership, and just making it very clear in in briefs, you know, 
this is the piece, this is the length it needs to be, these are the keywords to be hit, here's how it ties into the wider strategy, here's the quarterly content calendar that th- this piece is going into You know, January, here's the piece that's going to be part of the same topic cluster in February and March. Um, just to give you know, folk as much information as they need, you know, we, we are blessed to work with a very talented team. They understand content marketing or digital marketing. They understand the roles that we're engaging. So if you give them the info, they go, okay, cool. Well, that totally makes sense because this is the keyword we're trying to rank for. Here are the four pieces of cluster content. That's the pillar. Totally makes sense. I know what I'm doing now. I can write these four blog posts with an understanding of that strategy, and I can design the the I can design the creatives for it with a focus on LinkedIn and Twitter because I know those are the biggest platforms for our B2B SaaS client. On the, I mean, again, I'm looking at this from the perspective of a writer, but I think you know you, it can get a bit formulaic as a writer where you're just you're receiving these briefs and you, you know you've got to turn out a certain number of articles each each week and you're you know you're looking at hitting your your budget numbers and things like that um but to to infuse um i think a creative perspective particularly on um human psychology like if i, if I had a, a, a discipline that i would want every single marketer to study i think it would be human psychology um hands down because I think understanding that, um, you know, there, there's so much of that in, in how we think about the funnel and like, you know, just, you know, human behavior and why people make the decisions that they do and calls to action and how they're received and things like that, um, even down to the level of copy. I think infusing that into the writing process, the design process in the midst of, you know, a, a business where it's, you know, very process driven and formulaic and, you know, it feels not like a very truly creative environment. And, and also when you're sometimes sitting by yourself in, in, you know, a remote work context and you're not having those interactions with the team. I think that to me is like a really fascinating problem for agency owners and marketers to, to solve as we move more into, you know, fully distributed um, workplaces. Um, so yeah, that's something I think about a lot. That's that's partly why I think we named our agency what we did because we want to just constantly remind people like who we are and what we stand for and that we are, you know, it could be B2C, it could be B2B, but it really is H2H. It really is human to human at the end of the day. So infusing that perspective into everything we do from the copy to the design to the outreach um, that we're making, promotion. Um, I think that's like the, the most fascinating intellectual uh, challenge that, that we face. So And just to that, empowering the team to know they can truly contribute to any of those stages. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's not, here's the brief, write it. You know, we don't care about your feedback. They can absolutely push back, you know, highlight their expertise, affect the strategy and impact it. We hugely welcome that and, you know, do view it as a collaborative rather than prescriptive process. Speaking more generally about the pros and cons of what you've experienced over the last couple of years. So these can be the more emotional sides um it can be practical examples of the benefits that you've seen let's start with the pros of uh, having a fully remote team the things you've experienced the things that you've seen maybe will do you want to start what do you see as the main pros of a fully distributed team so for me the, the biggest pro is the um the how brilliant the teams we can build for our clients are um so when we get a client in in a sector you know we don't just go all right we need a copywriter we go all right so you are hr tech um you know we have about 200 freelancers that we um are part of our kind of ecosystem of of work um of literal humans let's find someone with specialist copywriting and content marketing strategy um experience in hr tech let's find a designer that understands it let's find a seo person with experience in it like like, let's build a team that is almost the perfect team for this client you know the the core admin role doesn't really matter like the, the, the internal team handles that kind of project management side of thing and that really doesn't need to be specialist you know project managing um uh, for someone in the cannabis industry and someone in the hr tech industry is the same thing yeah. but for all of the roles that involve specialisms um, and expertise we find the best people we can with with genuine experience um and that's something we we wouldn't be able to do i think with an in-house team you know with an in-house team your designer and your copywriter are your designer and your copywriter and they you know let's say your copywriter is called bob 
Bob is going to be working across all accounts and is going to be a bit of a jack of all trades rather than a master. And so, you know, they, they probably know enough about HR tech to write about it convincingly, but they don't really understand the community and they don't really understand the type of content that works. Um, whereas with our model, you know, we make sure that we do hire someone that, that absolutely does. So I think that's, that's the biggest sort of pro and, and kind of tied to that is the flexibility it gives with, to work with clients across various industries. Um, and also, the, I mean, the other thing with regards to flexibility that we've certainly seen is it, we can scale up or down very quickly. Um, we don't have to have a conversation where me and Paul go, oh, we're doing quite well are we doing well enough to hire a full-time team member? Um, if we lose a client, um, most of the cost of that client stops as well. You know, we have the core team that are, are, are on salary roles, but the, you know, most of the cost of a client comes from the, the freelance work. So once that client has paused or left, so do those freelancers. Um, and similarly on the flip side, when we land five clients, um, you know, me and Paul don't have to go, Oh God, how are we going to hire? How are we going to go through the hiring process for another two designers and a copywriter? Um, you know, we just flex our network of freelancers in about three days. Normally we've got, you know, another, um, all of the team members we need to execute on that. And we are only hiring them on knowing that we've also got that extra income. So scaling up or down has been super easy for us to do. Um, and again, there's just far less risk to it. You know, we don't ever have to worry about having hired a full-time team member. And then the next day, our biggest client leaving us and us going, oh crap, we've got to fire someone. So I, I think those have been the two biggest pros from, from my end. I'd echo that. And I, I just, I think for me, like this, this is the big transformation for me. I think it's just the fact that it's a lifestyle, you know, just the, re the remote work that a globally distributed um, framework. Uh, you know, I don't spend my time worrying about what employees are doing or not doing. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm free to go for a run in the morning or go to the museum in the middle of the day. Or, you know, if Will's got a dentist appointment, so be it, Will, you know, get your teeth. Like, it's just, it, it, it's, I think that's like, to me, that freedom and that flexibility in, you know, how you manage your day as an individual, but also as a member of the team, I think it's just absolutely priceless. And, and that's a, a nice corollary to, you know, what Will said about being able to build, you know, the right team for, for our clients and, and just the, the people that we want to work with. But um, I think offering that, especially, I think a lot of people got a taste of that too, through the pandemic of like, whoa, this is remote work. And for some people, I was like, wait, this is not quite remote work. This is not like sipping a latte at a cafe in Mexico City. This is working in the middle of a pandemic. So like, let's <laughs> let's distinguish between the two here. But um, to me, that that's truly like just the, the gift that keeps on giving is that freedom, that flexibility, that self-determination that you can have as a freelancer working in this context. Um, and, and I'd love to build on that. I'd love to you know, fill our freelancers plates with, uh, you know, great clients. I'd love to, you know, down the line offer something akin to like a universal basic income to creatives who can, you know, just kind of sit on our roster and wait for these great clients to come in, but also have the, the, the resources to just take care of themselves and their families as they're, as they're doing that. Um, I don't, I don't love not being able to always offer steady, steady work, but I know that's like not fully our responsibility, but, you know, sort of long-term dreaming, long-term vision, I think, that's the kind of reality that I'd love to create for the creator, the creatives in our on our team. On that point, I'm interested to know. So we're looking at this through the agency lens, but taking a look through it through the freelancer lens, I'm assuming that what's happened over the last couple of years has also meant there are more opportunities out there for people to build uh, second incomes. So mm. people that maybe weren't freelancers already that can now, because of agencies like ours going to remote models, they can now use their skills and their interests to build a second stream of income. Uh, have you seen any of that just from the people that you reach out to where, you know, maybe they weren't freelancing prior to the pandemic, but they've taken an opportunity to generate a second income through freelancing because of the remote working nature of uh, yeah, what's changed? De definitely. I mean, I I've seen this in a couple different ways over the past like five or six years working working remotely is, and, and more recently, I think for, through the pandemic, I've seen people be a lot more, um, I would say, like strident, maybe is the word yeah. about like their their rates. I've seen people be a lot more selective about um, the kinds of work that they want to do and the kinds of work that they don't want to do. Um, and in a way, it's like it's really empowering. It's really, you know, um, 
uh, gratifying to see people sort of assert themselves in, in this sort of new economy that's evolving. Um, but also, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it can be challenging as an agency owner to kind of fit, you know, the, the, the demands for higher pay and specific yeah. types of work into the client engagement. So that is a tricky thing. But I'd, I'd rather solve that than have freelancers and creatives suffer, you know, as I think they have in the past where they were just, you know, and I did this when I started, I had absolute you know, garbage sort of writing work that was, you know, 10 cents, uh, you know, a word or something like that for, you know, these massive, you know, uh, sort of content mill publications, things like that. And then I eventually found better clients, but I don't want other creatives and freelancers to have to go through that. I want them to have, you know, great clients, great engagements, well-paying, you know, rates and, you know, that freedom and flexibility as well. But, but yeah, I've definitely seen the transformation over the past few years here. I think as well to um, add to that, along with a lot of folk um, going freelance with full-time roles, which we absolutely have seen. And, and, you know, sometimes we'll have one of our freelancers go, hey, I can only do two pieces a month now because I'm landing a freelance, sorry, I'm landing a full-time role. So we we have to keep that flexibility in. Um, One of the other things I think we've absolutely seen is it opens up a lot of the world for, um, in terms of talent, you know, Paul touched upon it earlier, but, you know, we we employ people um, from, all over the world from, you know, like Nigeria through to, um, Australia, America, you know, Estonia, Czech Republic. Um, and a lot, a lot of folk have, um, suddenly become accessible because, you know, there are, they've realized there are agencies like us out there that, you know, need brilliant design work. Um, and that it really doesn't, we don't care where, where you're from. We don't care. You know, we only care about the quality of the, your work and the quality of you as a person. And so we've, we've got some great genuinely distributed, um, teams across the world that, you know, we wouldn't, you wouldn't normally find a, like an agency hiring a writer from Nigeria, but it's, you know, it's hugely helped us um, in both our client work, the diversity of the thinking, the creativity, and just generally our access to great talent. Cause we're not, you know, trying to find good folk in within a sort of 10 mile radius of our office, which we're literally going, who is the best, you know, SEO person in the world with an internet connection mm-hmm. that is willing to work for us. And on the cons, so there have undoubtedly been challenges for you, Paul, you just touched on one that which was about which is a really interesting one, we could record a whole episode about this, which is maybe this shift in the gig economy, which might raise the prices Mm. of freelancers. Again, I could Mm. probably think and talk about that all day. But is there anything else that comes to mind top of mind for you about some of the difficulties that either you've overcome, or maybe you're experiencing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think I think just quick, you know, um, the the i think the the rates thing i mean we've definitely seen the effects of like sort of the great resignation and and i would say like increasing demands for better paying uh you know gigs and, and jobs i think you know will's point about communication and just getting people into that you know working style of over communicating about where they are on things i think can be you know a bit of a challenge i think um team culture that's something that you know i'm constantly like trying to you know wrap my head around like what kind of culture do we want to build do we want to have retreats do we want to you know get people on on team calls on a regular basis what is that going to mean for the quality of work and and um, just the relationships between folks um you know that's i think that's something we've really not focused on a lot as we've tried to build you know our first first couple of years here but maybe something in the future that we want to focus on a bit more um and, and to me, that's a real existential question as well. It's like, you know, I, I know that for a fact, there are some freelancers on our team who would really just love this to be, you know, a very distributed sort of confederation of freelancers. We don't get too, you know, involved in each other's lives. We just work on projects together and, and that's it. And, and people, some people are perfectly fine drawing a the line there. Some people want a bit more where they want to come together once or twice a year and bond and get to know the people they work with, um, you know, digitally, at least, um, at least, you know, that amount and, and take it from there. So just trying to like navigate those different perspectives and, and um, uh, you know, just about what kind of environment we want to work in. I think those are some of the big challenges. Yeah. I think one of the um, kind of tied into that question of culture is also that question of like what you want to build and the responsibility you have for the freelancers that might only do sort of two bits of work for you a month, you know, a lot of something that is is definitely a challenge for some people about the fully remote lifestyle is is the mental health side of things in terms of you know you are alone um a fair bit more it's far harder to catch um when a team member is struggling and if you do you know how do you meaningfully offer help to them 
in a way that actually benefits them. Um, so I think there's the mental health is, side of things is certainly something we're going to be looking at a lot in 2022. Um, also, just from the practical side of things, you know, syncing up time zones can sometimes be quite difficult. Um, you know, for certain bits of work, it doesn't matter. But if you are trying to figure out a way for, as we have done quite a few times recently with one of our clients, sync up Australia, the East Coast of America and London, um, you're not going to have a great time. <laughs> um, and that that is a practical practicality um, that, you know, it, you do have to do a little bit more work to work around. Um, but I think the, the main thing we're going to focus on in 2022 is, you know, like Paul said, figuring out the company culture you want to build and finding how building ways to really really support our team along with being the morally right thing to do making them feel more like they're part of a family and you know want to produce their best work for literal humans because they actually love the company and they're excited by the work they do and appreciate the effort we put into offering them more than just you're a freelancer deliver it in a week's time and, and that's basically the end of the interaction that is an excellent point to close on. And it talks a lot and it speaks a lot, the changing cultures that great marketers not only need, but are starting to expect. Thank you so much for taking the time with me on this episode today. But before I let you both go, do you want to let our listeners know where they can find out more about you individually and then collectively literal humans? Uh, yeah, sure. You can um, find uh, myself on W Gadsby Pete on Twitter um, just William Gadsby Pete on LinkedIn. Uh, it's quite quite a distinct name. You you might see my brother on there as well. And then from the agency side of things, again, Literal Humans. Quite you'll find us on all social channels and our website, literalhumans dot com. Um, and then yeah, Paul, uh, you're, do you want to uh, push your your personal uh, personal accounts? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a luddite compared to Will, but um, yeah, you can find us through literalhumans dot com, and then through the site there, you can link to my LinkedIn uh, page as well. And uh, yeah, happy to connect with folks there and uh, talk all things business and marketing and strategy. But yeah, it's been a great conversation. Thanks, y'all. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. This has been the Internet Marketing Podcast. Take care.